Welcome to this evening's DevX Tech Talks. These talks provide an outlet for tech preneurs to share their views and provide insight on many interesting tech-related topics. We have two talks this evening. In talk one, we'll be hearing about opportunities for economic growth, the impact of innovation. This presentation will look at recent innovations in technology and the positive impact they have had on economies worldwide. Then, together we will discuss the benefits we can gain if we adopted those same innovations locally. Our presenter, Jeremy Stephen, lectures in banking and finance at the University of the West Indies, Cahill Campus. He has extensive experience in private equity and economic consulting in Barbados and regionally. Let's welcome Jeremy. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Listen, I, I'm so impressed, right? Um, the amount of people that botched my introductions over here in Barbados, they say, I'm, I'm glad that Elvin thought very smart to have me be introduced by some AI or by the computer. Uh, I'm very impressed. And I need somebody in this room to do me a favor because I'm very homesick with Guyana. I'm always down there and I haven't been for months. I need somebody to get me some fun like right now. I, I, I'm craving some fun. Some plain tarts, some cheese puffs, some cheese, whatever it is, man. I really miss it. Now, yeah, and, and, and the love affair of Gogo Guyana started about five years ago when one of your former, I guess, luminary, not former luminary, one of your luminaries, uh, Dr. Cecil Ramarat, uh, he was responsible for feeding me this idea that Guyana is the future of the Caribbean. Now, when I was 17 years old, a lifetime ago, I thought it would have been the future, but I wasn't really thinking that big. I thought, just as our leaders uh, back in the 70s and 80s thought, that Guyana would be this bread basket of the Caribbean. I, I, I never really understood what that meant, but technology is something that I was interested in for, for some time, and Cecil brought me down there five years ago, and I, I'll tell you one thing, this major turned back on one time. I, I was amazed, all right? I was amazed at the opportunities. I was amazed with the energy of the people. I was amazed with the hustle. I, I think probably outside of Jamaica, there's no more of a hustle in the Caribbean than um, what you get down in Georgetown. And believe you me, it is for that reason I figure some of the suggestions I'm going to offer today, despite Let's say the lack of activity by the government. I know how it is though. They're seeing both sides of the government. Um, despite the lack of activity in terms of pushing this area, or let's say the early stages of pushing it, there's so much potential in a broad base among the areas. So what I'm going to try to do is to offer some areas and try to tie in the CARICOM experience because if you're thinking about just serving, I can't even say 750,000. Um, Guyana has a net immigration rate of what? Around a zero, not zero, sorry, it's around 8%. So 8% of the population falls uh, almost every year. But what I would tell you is outside of thinking like that, you should probably even consider CARICOM as your source market. A product I would love right now, an app I would love right now, as corny as this sounds, an app I would love right now is one that I can just click on my app and I get some pineapple, some pine, one time. They ship directly to my door. That's all I eat when they come down there. And sometimes I go in Kitty. Maybe if there was an app that I can get some of that food from um, Open Kitty that I had, oh my, what's the name of that place? So, uh, if John was there, you would remind me, but he always took me there for some uh, cook up and walk off. So, these things, if you're thinking about a puncture in Guyana, you should really think about the future in Caracom. Now, before we go into some of these opportunities, allow me to show off a little app that I cooked up just before we came on. Uh, we came on in. So now that like notice the room is a bit darker than it is when we spoke a little earlier today. So a little nerd in me decided to cook up a little thing in Siri, just to show that, I know you guys know to do this, but even if any of you in there don't have coding experience, which you know, it's important in the future that persons like myself, as an economist, be able to code even just to fix something like lighting in the home. So for instance, hold on. Hey Siri, turn on my lights, please. Let's see if it works. No technology always feels just before. Yeah, 
Here we go. So, something as simple as this, like cooked up in about five minutes, just using my iPhone, a little experience to test code. I understand that an app is more than just something for me to play with, something that I have to use on my phone. An app is really an extension of any service or any transaction I require. So case in point, a big opportunity for me, and I preach this in Barbados all the time, man. The, hun the, the people that are online, I, I'm seeing outside of my friends, a couple hundred people from Barbados watching this, and they could vouch for this. The biggest area that I, I feel that can transform Caribbean economies and has, in my estimates, the ability to actually double the GDP of Barbados as soon as it happens is a focus on logistics. So by a show of hands, how many of you know what logistics is? It's a broad area, but by a show of hands. Eldon and the other guy. All right. So very few of you know what logistics is yet. Guyana is one of the biggest logistics hubs in all of CARICOM. I know most of you go down there with the port. You see John Bonanz and those guys moving a bunch of containers. You hear about all the oil development going on up in Burby side. Uh, you hear about, you, know, you see tons of trucks driving up towards border market delivering fruits. And yet, most of us would have thought that there was a way to improve all of this by just using the telephone app. Connectivity in Guyana, if any of you fly out of Volvo often enough, you would notice there's a big sign right there in the departure lounge that did yourself put up. Any of you are familiar with that sign? A big map. By a show of hands, anybody? All right, so one person. Essentially, when you look at that map, Guyana, up to two years ago, in the heavily populated areas, was around 80% connected. In other words, along that north coast, well, east coast and whatnot, and going all the way out to Cameroon, you 80% of your population is covered and could therefore be part of that market. So 80% of 750,000 people would be aging just over 650 people. And most of them have one common problem in there. Diana is big as hell. It takes around four hours for me to get into the quarantine. If I remember correctly, when I went to just see Suriname, see Suriname. I've never been to Suriname, so I drove to see and go back. It was four hours both ways. And you've got people well spread along that north coast. And many of them require certain services. There's a town. If you need to actually create my Belgians, because I never remember the name of the town, but when you cross over the um, the Burbis River, and before you get to the Burbis River, get to that bridge, there's a town right there. What's the name of that town? Right there where you can get on the ferries or get onto the bridge. Sorry? I can hardly hear, but whatever. You say it, it is, but it's the town, the last town you see before you get onto the bridge and before you reach the last event. So, when I was in that town last year, I noticed that uh, the guys that have that piece of place right there on Camp Street that's popular, and the, the, guys that, the guy that runs Quiznos, Quiznos and um, Church's Chicken. So, there's a Church's Chicken over there, apparently, the first branch was there. And he has a population that's spread up over in New Amsterdam and all the way down to Babu John, and there's no churches to check in. But yet, apparently the business does well without delivery. And all I was thinking to myself, and I'm already giving anything to me, that somebody, if they just offer an app for delivery, they can clean up everything, clean up the entire population down there in New Amsterdam, which is certain to grow because of the oil discovery that you have and in Guyana. So something as simple as setting up logistics apps in a place that's bigger than England, but has a population that's just twice the size of Barbados, you already have ample opportunities to do several businesses. So you're looking at transporting gold. You think about the gold miners, for instance. A lot of them, yes, they're not near a cell tower. And of course, if you look at the new cell map, um, the global airport, you do know already the gold miners don't have access to the um, to data, to the 3G data that you guys have no thank God because it opens up a lot of opportunities for you. But um, more importantly, they do use satellite phones, but yet it's more expensive to make a call over a satellite phone than transmit data, or to even use SMS over satellite phones. So you even end up 
reducing costs in the gold mining industry, which has been for the better part of the last four years in main income earner, legal income earner in Diana. Allow me to say that because I'm not very easy about how things are. So in agriculture, you could also fight match farmers in proper markets. So as opposed to farmers wasting valuable resources because the amount of pine, the amount of star fruit, the, the amount of um, Chinese cabbage, the amount of things I've seen wasted in, in border market, because I've, I've ironically been to Guyana 25 times, not 25, 20 times, I've never been to Starbuck. But the amount of times that I've seen um, fruit wasted in border market, it would tell me that if these farmers that have cell phones walk to border market right now, I'm quite sure you would see this, all of them, around five o'clock when traffic down there essentially does, are on their phones texting somebody. And in my mind, I'm thinking they could be finding customers right now if they just had a simple app that allows themselves to match themselves to customers. Or maybe you guys could provide a border market app that allows tourists like me or others to easily come on and they would know if there's fresh deliveries, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables up there in border market. So, Overnight, you can realize if somebody builds this app and they can sell the meat, sell in opposition to artisans, to farmers, to, to vendors, you can reduce the cost of doing business in Guyana, which already is amongst the lowest in Caracom, save 80. 80 is way cheaper, right? Imagine how that can positively impact your export market. Imagine how that can just reduce the cost of moving goods to the ships up there in the pool. Imagine how that can reduce the cost of shipping over to Suriname. Before I walk with logistics, imagine if you had an app like this when the crisis happened in the rice industry last year. Where because you know Venezuela in retaliation over the oil, the oil discovery decided to do what? Not to buy as much rice as they did before. And then there were lots of farmers, man, of men in Burmese, uh, now Prasad especially, I know this much. They were scrambling to fight buyers. And I'm quite sure there are more than ample buyers in Georgetown for these products at low prices, at wholesale prices. And yet, all this information is out here. You've got a market that is bigger than Burmese. I'm not saying that you do have an app like that here, but these things can lower the cost of doing business and they are significant. And by the way, any of you guys can stop me. I know it's hard for me to hear on this thing, but interrupt me, stop me. The I guess over the next 20 minutes, I'll talk a bit more, and then I'll get questions from you, and we can have a tete tete. But the next area that I think is extremely big in Guyana, uh, by a show of hands, how many of you went to QC? Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. If you went to QC, raise your hand. All right, good, we got two Q, three QC people there. I always tell my people there that if I was ever so fortunate to marry any these women, my children would go to QC instead of come here, which I went to here in Barbados. You guys are the greatest. But yet, a school that produces regularly children who get up to what, 15, 12, 15, 20 CXCs in some cases, is not really represented of the entire population in Guyana. You've got a lot of isolated communities that I spoke about, up in Cameroon, down in Burbies, further down in Quarantine, down in um, near Brazil, very isolated communities that very well might deserve the same level of education or the chance to uh, a similar level of education as the children in QC get, the children at Bishops get, at St. Joseph get. Yeah, I've been around Diana long enough to study this. And the cost of education worldwide has fallen, believe you me, because of the apps, and, well, because of websites like uh, Udemy, which I always tell children here, with Udemy.com. I tell children here in Barbie this often, that the parents should be taking courses on Udemy during the summer of all wasted talents. Learn to program using Udemy.com. That's U-D-E-M-Y.com. Anybody there heard of it before? Yeah, amazing program, right? And then, for those of you that are obviously college age or just about to go off to college, there's a whole open whole spirit, MIT open whole spirit. Berkeley has their free education as well, 
courses. And then you've got CAN Academy, P H A N Academy, that covers lower secondary school, so junior school up to college uh, level courses, or at least subjects. And I'm thinking this is very indicative of education costs dropping worldwide. Although many of those things I suggested aren't traditionally accredited, you can see very well in the near future that most people are digital natives like yourself. The children as well will be even better digital natives from the time they're four point months old. They definitely will be interacting with some hardware. All right, these guys will be learning online before they learn the way you're learning. But yeah, the way you're learning from me right now is a huge leap on what happened a year ago or what happened two years ago, three years ago. So in Guyana, right now, the person who focuses on education for those isolated communities can attract massive funding from the UN. I know the UN DP has a massive presence there in Guyana. You guys get an envious amount of funding down there from the UN DP that I wish would be redirected here, but hey, it's all Garakom, right? And I'm quite sure you can receive the kind of support you're looking for if you focus on education of isolated communities. Also, on a soft note, and I don't want to say so, but on a softer note, I can also encourage you to, to look after disadvantaged individuals, minorities, Amerindian communities, for instance, minorities in terms of, well, let me not match minorities and women, but also focusing on female education is a very big topical area worldwide. And in Guyana, we are a disproportionate among men get to receive up to secondary school level education, college education, UG, I'm quite sure you can see that, even though, yeah, there are also women at UG. Typically, you can see income levels of families that afford to send their children to UG are much higher than those that have women working within the household from a very young age. If you get where I'm going, right? So there are ample opportunities to receive sponsorship from the UNDP in such areas. So honestly, although I'm very big on logistics and I think that's your bar, I mean, this is for you guys and also the members, you have, you guys have a perfect use case. Actually to go back there a bit, you have the cheapest, although you have some of the highest energy costs in all of Caracom, all the water, hydroelectricity plants that, that have been spoken about for years ago with the Brazilian border and water. Yeah, I know the government's been slow for some reason on that. You have it amongst the higher energy costs in all the region. Barbados probably the only place that beats you right now. But yet, transportation costs in Guyana are amongst the lowest. Three, well, three billion dollars can get me anywhere in Georgetown from a taxi. Green ice cabs and walk on. Three billion dollars is the equivalent of three billion dollars, which is nothing. That's bus carrier. While the bus fares walk around 60 billion cents, it's 60 dollars still, right? Because I haven't caught a bus in a year and a year. It's around 60 dollars, right? How much? It's about 60 GT, right? Yeah. So it's about 60 GT. I haven't caught a bus in about a year, so you need to. I mean, when I'm accustomed to paying two dollars here in Barbados, but I'll be honest, I haven't caught a bus in Barbados. The bus fare here being two dollars at best. I could as well pay the extra dollar and get ready to go, you know, in turn. Um, but you have the most cheapest transportation costs and, and you really have to exploit that because like there are apps here in Barbados, there's at least two apps here that are trying to do what Lyft and Uber do. And the whole premise behind it is to reduce traffic so of course people can spend more time either in leisurely activity, which of course results in a faster growing economy. Or people actually working, less time in traffic, more money being made, correct? Or less you can make money from people being in traffic. So you and Diana, luckily you don't have traffic problems, except on the um, the East Bank. I find you got some traffic problems on the East Bank, and it's close early in the morning. But in Georgetown itself, no traffic to really speak of all compared to Trinidad, or even Barbados, or even Kingston. Right? So you've got already perfect ground there to start dealing with some logistics problems. And education, perfect ground, cheap to start with. And luckily, you've got free genome. A year ago, 
or just over a year ago when you still had edge, I would be hard pressed to deliver this discussion in the way that I'm delivering it right now as totally enthusiastic. Another area, and one of your colleagues is joining me through my Facebook like page, a uh, young guy by the name of Raphael Basco, he was one of my students at the University of the West Indies. Um, one thing he said to me over and over is that your finance industry is ready for this uh, disruption. I mean, it still bothers me right now that unless I have, and I'm kind of giving away something here to say this, unless I have a GBTI debit card, that I must use a credit card to swipe at very few terminals they have in Georgia. And I'm thinking to myself, or anti-money laundering, the anti-money laundering bill, which was very contentious, was just signed into law from there. And of course, well sorry, is it signed into law? I know there was a whole bunch of problems to run with The anti-money laundering bill? Anybody? Yeah, it's fast. It's, it's been passed, right? Good, good. Because that was a major mandate of um, at noon. All right, so good. It was passed. So you've got the perfect rooms right now to encourage people not to use as much cash as they use in Guyana. I hate walking around with towels. Every time I walk around with too much towels or rangers, all I tell myself is a policeman to pull me one side and tell me, buddy, something wrong with you here. You follow where I'm coming from. I, I, especially given the cat for all of your exact sir, I know I have to pay him. And I don't want to pay him. Right? I don't want to pay him. So I would love, honestly, if the disruption within finance can happen with respect to my phone and being able to conduct transactions on my phone in different stores. Something as simple as cryptocurrencies, if you can convince more than you to set Bitcoin, that's the, I guess, the first step in terms of conditioning people to use their cell phones to conduct business. I'm not suggesting that Apple Pay, for instance, or any APIs will be readily available in Guyana just yet. I mean, anti-money laundering laws were just passed, right? And, and Barbados is just a couple of years ahead. So I don't expect you would have that anytime soon neither. But in the very least, you can say step all of the regulations and whatnot by using cryptocurrencies as a way to sensitize people to using less cash. So case in point, you're, you can start with your businesses. I, as a Barbadian, am more willing, and I will admit, I do hold money in Guyana, right? Not stupid, there's too much land for me not to want to invest, right? But I don't want, for instance, to be coming to Guyana and happen to withdraw tons of towels and readers. And for the pages listening, that's $1,000 notes and $5,000 notes, right? I don't want to be drawing notes, walking around Georgetown to conduct my transactions. I'm more willing, if it were that Eldon could rent me some of his space at me once to his, that Eldon, that Eldon, sorry, is willing to accept some of my Bitcoin. It's the same transaction. Less, uh, and I'm less likely to be having to pay off a break. Because I'm quite sure the police won't be accepting Bitcoin anytime soon. You, you, you get where I'm coming from, right? And in terms of time and safety, and in terms of different kinds of investors, it takes like the Gabriella beds and bits that might be willing to come and employ or to transact with people. The, the amount of investment opportunity that can come because of that, it might not seem big because the Bitcoin market capitalization is just under 20 billion US dollars, but the blockchain technology that you learned about earlier today that drives that very well is the future. And if Guyana is able to start utilizing that within the finance industry, even if it is, say, a parallel finance industry, I'm not trying to talk about contraband, right? But any parallel track, uh, finance industry that you have, you can attract massive investors, which would contribute, of course, to the GDP of Guyana. And that could be linked towards things like rule. Like, no, for instance, you can't sell rule unless you deal with the rule board. So somebody needs to tell the Google board to start allowing themselves to use more electronic means of transactions. Somebody has to tell churches chicken that I should be able to use more than just my credit card. Somebody should be able to tell churches chicken that they should have an app 
or even uses a, a, a service like PA, Payoneer. How many of you guys are aware of Payoneer? P-A-Y-O-N-E-R, good, a few in the back. If you are a developer, if you are a so-called internet entrepreneur, you have to be using that. You have to use Payoneer. I got to actually thank my boy Shannon Clark for really redirecting me there because I was a big a PayPal baby, a PayPal hits the Caribbean. Payoneer loves us. Try to use Payoneer. So for instance, I, I would think that Church's Chicken should belong, should be using Payoneer to accept payments off of my phone. If you see where I'm coming from, as opposed to, again, a major problem for our investor slash um, tourist like myself, who would have to walk around with tons of towels, and I know I should really get a towel up because I'm sweating, but tons of towels and, and, and rangers, right? So another area where I figure Ghana could benefit immensely from uh, with respect to technology, which I've seen, because I've, I've seen people in like, uh, John Busey doing, doing websites that uh, speak to this entertainment. All right, so when it was there last year, normally when it was there, well not last year, we were there a couple months ago, but last year Christmas, I love a guy in Christmas, I must say, but normally I would ask some of my friends for some suggestions as, well, as to what I should do when I'm in there. Right? What I'm there for Christmas. I said, everybody I knew would love to go around eating from different people around Christmas time. Let's go be into these Christmases and be in the week. Try that barbecue on somebody to shoot. But I'm looking around for ideas as to what I can do. And then John tells me that there's one service online, not even in app form. I'm not sure if it's a app yet, which is a directory or a schedule of all of the events that's supposed to happen in Georgetown and down in Lyndon. I think it was focusing in New Amsterdam. Yeah, it was focused on New Amsterdam, Lyndon, and Georgetown, those three areas. And I'm thinking to myself, why is it this thing happen? And then I went further. Why can't I buy a ticket to these events through, um, through my phone? Better yet, why couldn't I buy a ticket without having to deliver cash? Imagine you had someone like Shannon Tatum that was there. You guys are aware that Shannon Tatum was down here, right? Yeah. About a year ago. Imagine Shannon comes up the, drug, the jungle and, and, for lack of a better term, wanted to go to bar room. But he has no bank account in Guyana. He did not want to be seen by the ticket go to bar room, but he wanted to just sneak right in and right back. Now, I'm not saying that all tourists or Americans would want to go to bar room, but what I'm saying here is that you could be missing the opportunity for many establishments, which might be entertaining to the tourists, to the average tourists, the green tourists, the green industry tourists, or however you want to be able to, or even people that just want to come down there for lunch. You're missing an opportunity to get more people to come and partake in entertainment. Would you believe I've gone out to Guyana three times from Ash and never attended a party? Guess what? Well, number one, I don't really party, but guess the other reason. Take a good guess as to what. It pertains to something I said a little earlier. Because I'll have to walk around with too much toes to buy tickets, to spend money. I like pineapples, I like pineapple juice, I like juices. My friends like to drink a little drink. Rum and cheap in Guyana. So I obviously be walking around with 100K or five or at least 50,000, at least 50, 50 grand, just to have a good night on the own. That isn't conducive to economic activity in the underground economy or even above board economy if you get where I'm coming from. So you definitely have to disrupt entertainment now. The first thing any of you should be thinking about very now is to mimic a service like what we have over here called Ticket Pile. Now I'm not saying Barbados is where all of the solutions live, but Ticket Pile has its place and it has done well in ensuring that people can spend easily without having to uh, go out of their wheel and what we did before, which was, oh, 
you have to go to a gas station to buy a ticket or go to a pharmacy to buy a ticket. You had to go to this next place to go and buy a ticket. It was very unproductive. So I just gave summaries of different areas. Again, to recap, I'm very big on logistics. I figured generally throughout Caricom, if you focus on logistics, if you focus on transshipment, which I know your government, well, with DPP, we're more looking at it. We'll focus on transshipment from Brazil up to Caricom and beyond using the uh, George Home Port. I know, or at least I believe, even something as big as transshipment to as small as utilizing your taxis, your cheap taxis in London, in New Amsterdam, to, to deliver goods, you know, or to even have a taxi app. So that, you know, one of the things that really messes with me is that I will call the dispatch, for instance, and be like, yeah, want to pick up from down Pier Street going down to uh, border market and the person will even quote me a price. But I know having come there quite often what the price should be. And you know the taxis they are driving very quickly here in Barbados you make a day in a year get a taxi. So a taxi goes up but in the house within three minutes I get in. That's stupid me, right? I'm a little nice. So I normally say good morning or good evening, one. and I can't go off a guy in his accent, and my Beijing accent can be very right sometimes, especially if I'm Russian. So I get in a taxi, and I'm like, good morning, man. First thing taxi driver hears is tourists. Second thing taxi driver he hears is, or tells himself is, huh, all right, buddy, I told you to go to Georgetown as if I ain't know what's going on, right? So, the culture of service in Guyana is one where I guess a lot is left for granted or taken for granted. So it just seems like the dispatch, the dispatches take so many calls that they just don't bother to give the courtesy of quoting a price. So normally I, I call back the dispatch when the taxi driver tries to pull that one on me. Because who knows, you know? You may very well get frustrated and you don't know what happened. What would happen? So I, I could actually avoid that. If I could just pull it up. On the phone, like, yeah, this is what this is what I wanted. You can't refuse it. You follow where I'm coming from. Something as simple as that when it comes to logistics, can reduce delivery times, reduce delivery costs. Guyana again is a relatively large population in a much larger land. You could really utilize um, logistics driven apps to reduce a lot of these inefficiencies, using a lot of open data as well, too. Because they like, like Actually, no, Guyana has a problem with COVID. That's another thing you can help the government with. But I'm quite sure that all of you have phones on you with GPSs, so I can track you if I really need it. So you can utilize that. I also mentioned before education, which I think is the biggest area that can transform Guyana. Uh, especially if some of you guys create an app that allows someone who works in the oil industry or on a part-time basis up in Texas, a guy needs that has done well with here, for instance, or a Beijing or a Titian or an Antiguan that can come and teach Guyanese how to work in oil so that when the oil fields are ready, that a whole bunch of expats come in and they take the good jobs away. You follow where I'm coming from? So that's just one of many examples of what can happen over there. And also, generally, belief for small economies like ours is that education is the key way that you can drive development. So if they ever wants to really develop, it cannot be true just having all investment. But people must be able to utilize the wealth. And if it is that the government doesn't have as a priority education of all, which is although it's billion in Barbados, um, a matter of ours, everybody should be educated. I'm not saying everybody is, because there's some stupid agents, huh? but I'm saying that everybody should be, or allowed, or have a fair chance. So if you don't have money to go to school, our government takes care of you, no questions asked. It's becoming tougher and much more challenging, but I know that bit. But I'm saying, if there's no mandate in the near future for Guyana to have that, it's your job. And you can get money from the UNDP. You don't even have to charge your communities. 
Guyana, Guyana is lucky in that respect where, or at least you are lucky, where there's going to be so much social entrepreneurship funding that can come once these ideas are generated. So you can end up educated, isolated communities. And who knows, in 10, 15 years, you can see isolated communities being very involved in, say, oil production. Or better yet, technology, yeah, I'm not even going to talk about future technologies and what I'm talking about what we can implement today. And then, I spoke about finance. All of these things are linked with respect to disrupting the financial sector. We all know right now, it's hard to get loans in Guyana. God, imagine asking for a loan for your business, right? And that's the truth everywhere. But in Guyana, the case is very uniquely difficult because not only are the banks not that willing to lend, but the interest rates in Guyana are stupendously good. Stupendously good. So, disruption of the finance industry in Guyana has to come from two things. Number one, you have to get less people accepting cash as the only means to conduct business. If it means that you have Bitcoin or you train people to accept Bitcoin, so do you. If it means that you get GBTI or some smaller bank like the one that banks um, the IEH owns, that's Citizens Bank, right? Citizens, right? Yeah. So if you get a small bank like Citizens, for instance, to, um, to even pilot some technology, it could actually open up spending in your hand. It can drop the cost because it'll be easier to track transactions, right? reason interest rates are high in Guyana is because we're a cash economy and we have a risk that come along with a cash economy such as well people hiding money people looking to wash money if you get more people looking to transact money digitally then of course it can reduce interest rates and then of course I would hope that banks are more open to funding more than just homes out in Providence you know, and, and, and homes on, on the East Bank and homes on the East Coast so, outside of that, if you get more consumer spending, it allows you as entrepreneurs, if they're using apps, e-commerce apps, to track your customers a lot more effectively. And as a result, then, you can continue to drop marketing costs. Costs in general should continue. And as a result, more profitability, more investment, more jobs, and so yeah. Finance has to be linked to all of these areas. Logistics, I spoke about. Education, I spoke about. Then last but not least, entertainment. I'll, I'll end by saying this before we can discuss. I want to be able to come to MASH early next year and not have to spend cash. I'm quite sure I can get a lot more agents to come through if they can buy tickets from Barbados for all the MASH fans. You get me? It's linked heavily to tourism, it's linked heavily to people being comfortable and spending more money. You get where I'm coming from, guys. So, I, I didn't have to speak the last 40 minutes and tell you that there's an inextricable link between economic performance and these technologies. Technology is what you would call the great balancer. It allows anyone with access and that access is becoming cheaper by the day. Anyone with access to effectively build world-leading companies. And the thing about it is, if none of you think you want to be the next Facebook, or more applicably, the next Tesla, you don't have to. You could just start a drop shipping business and sell pine down in Brazil and never even touch the pine. But of course, to touch, to, to have a drop shipping business do that, you must have the technology that allows you to always be in touch with the farmers, always in touch with the packagers, and then you should be able to track um, shipments. You see where I'm coming from. These services have to be built. But Guyana, in my mind, especially since you have that 3G technology in, that's the big, that, that was the biggest thing when, when I came here and I saw that Guyana finally had 3G. It gives you the grounds which you can actually compete with any country in the world in any technology. I know that GPL always has a black hole almost every day. But hey, if you're gonna start some, um, if you're gonna, I'm gonna give you an idea. 
Actually, Elder Tate this morning, if you can. All of you guys know that um, <laughs> Lyndon has the cheapest electricity costs in all of them, correct? You know, you know this, man. Show sure, man. Show me. Because they blew my mind when they phone this up. All right, so Elder knows. So why is nobody starting a server farm down in Linden? Tons of unemployed people, you know, in Linden. Tons just want a job. And all they got down in Linden, from what I remember, is a church's chicken, an ATM, a library, I didn't, even, I, didn't even, I didn't even know if there's a hotel down there. I, I had to leave to go to some other hotel. But basically, long story being short, you know, there are hotels across the other side of the Camarillo River. Right, so a Chinese restaurant, ATM, library, and a church's chicken is what I remember, and the regional office for that region. I think that's region six. Ten. Yeah, Ten. 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 Which one? Ten. 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 Right, thanks. So right, that's all I remember. And yet, it has the third largest population in all of them. Tons of unemployment, cheap electricity, the cheapest electricity because it's government subsidized, cheapest electricity in all of Caracom except for Trinidad, and there are no server farms down in Linden. And I'm quite sure the Black Oaks in Linden are well taken care of. And you can even, because you've got all of those bauxite plants on the old properties down there, set up a couple solar plants down there, and all of a sudden, you don't even have to worry about black holes. You've got government subsidized electricity and a huge expanse of land that you can set up a solar farm. And what all you can do is sell service space to not only just local Guyanese, because the pipes from Guyana run through Venezuela. You can end up selling cheap service space to Venezuela, which right now is in tunnels as a well. rule. You can sell cheap service space to Suriname, and all that you've got millions of possible customers. And, and you can sell um, cheap service space down in what's the name of that Brazilian city? The one is very near. Oh gosh, I don't remember it. it. Begins with N. But anyways, you can check, sell cheap service space to Brazil to Brazilian companies. So, in my mind, outside of, of course, my bias of Barbados, I honestly think Diana has some tremendous opportunity, simply because most people haven't identified the opportunity yet. Right? So, let's have a discussion. Thank you for listening to me, and let me hear what you have to say. Thank you. Why is this bunch of gang is a double man? <laughs> Alright, so I'm gonna sit here because I have some questions, but I'll let I'll let our audience so how about it first? Does anyone have any questions for Jeremy? Sorry, come again? Does anyone have any questions for Jeremy? Please don't let me sweat. All right, all right. Like the so let me let me start this off, Jeremy. So I think um, this was an excellent talk. Can you hear me? Thank you. I Can you hear me? You know the the suggestions you made are so simple. And I think sometimes we might, in our minds, overcomplicate things, especially when we're thinking about technological opportunities. For instance, apps and so forth. I mean, simple things like agriculture, finding some some way of connecting buyers with sellers and producers and so forth. That's obviously an opportunity, definitely. Logistics, that's biggest, uh, um, definitely. And um, where you mentioned about our finance industry, right, for uh, for disruption. That's not so true. As a matter of fact, we have in our audience uh, a group of individuals from Intellect Storm, and they're working towards uh, electronic payments uh, called, um, we call it Payments GY. And this links in with uh, mobile money from GTT. And uh, so, so at least we're making strides in, on that front. But the question I have is more of a broad-based one. Mm -hmm. we, we see all of these opportunities, right? What has Barbados done when it comes to culture? Because 
we find that there is an opportunity for technological change, but there, it has to be complemented or supported by cultural change. How does, what comes first? How do we address those two and help them to work in tandem to bring about effective technological change? Well, man, look, I'll tell you something, Ray. I, I, I'm glad you, you, you're so practical. The problem always with anything is, is certainly culture and how culture changes as time goes on. And allow me to say this, it's a common problem. It's a problem that happens in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, North the United States of America for that matter, um, were this robust in terms of just paying out millions of dollars on a flight one time, you know? It, it's, it's um, <laughs> the culture thing literally comes down to time and it comes down to just persistence. Nothing adventure, not thinking. So I'll give you a good example. I, I, I can't relate to the guy and he's experienced simply because I've only started with your um, going to Guyana over the last four years. So I'm a newbie. I'm a newbie. But in Barbados, I can tell you something as simple as an ATM. In the 1980s, we started having ATMs here and people would not use them. Number one. Number two. Before they were implemented, the banks thought the worst of them, that they would raise the cost of business, that they would increase theft. But I guess the introduction of ATMs were forced on Barbados, and unfortunately, um, the common experience of CARICOM is one where we have set instruction and inspiration and innovation from outside of CARICOM before we accept our own initiatives based on our own common or even particular experiences. So you would see a Canadian bank would come and say, you need to implement X, Y, Z. And then over time, customers, particularly those that have money that value their time, because most Caribbean people do not value their time. We drink way too much as a, as a culture to value our time and our health. If you, as far as I'm concerned, if you're very time sensitive, you don't do much things to impede on your ability to utilize such time. But so persons who value their time first even will be those that use these convenient um, services first. So then um, in terms of influencing a culture, my thought has always been that you need to value two things as an innovator, timing and also persistence. So for instance, we've got our economic issues over here in Barbados, we need the government inspired. If I say government led in my charge with treason, right? But government inspired. And I, that's a joke by the way, they won't be charging me for the treason, right? But uh we've got government led problems here in Barbados. And for many generations, Bajans would not speak up. Bajans would mutter under their breath. Curse the government, curse minister, curse that. Because we're frightened for ministers, but no. You would see, right, although it's still a bit of cowardice, and I'm not trying to insult my people, I understand the reason why. People would hide behind social media before they go in front of minister and tell them what they think, before they would organize, organically protest. So we had a protest here the other day that had to be led by unions, but yet people have been muttering under the rest for the longest time. It, it took a tax to cause that as opposed to many uh, let's say inconveniences that we've had as a people, all right? So, it takes time. I've been on a personal front doing my social activism for about five years and it's only now that people begin to take me somewhat seriously. I've got the same here, a couple thousand people who watch this and they take me seriously. Even if they don't agree with me, they take me seriously. That's why they invest their time but it took five years. And I'm not trying to sell a business, but the mechanics are the same. If you think that Guyanese that only had 3G yesterday will be willing to use a Guyanese service after thinking or being trained for most of their lives, claiming that things from Guyana are inferior and they would use the apps one time. No, you have to tell yourself that living or dying by this night yet. Eldon could not have started the own space seven years ago. Could not. There wasn't a developer culture. 
events that arose in the states that opened up open source technologies that allow every each and one of you right now to program just as if you were Silicon Valley, provided the environment for Elden to offer me on space. But it could not have worked seven years ago when so much technology was still closed. And you had little documentation and nobody was putting up how-to videos on YouTube and Udemy was just a thought in someone's dreams and Airbnb did it exist. You thought where I'm coming from. So be aware of the environment and stick with it. Stick with it. Even if it means that you have to do like Eldon and teach at, 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 at um, university before your idea comes to uh, fruition. That's why you change cultures. Opportunity, timing, and patience. Timing and patience. So any of you that has a stellar idea that doesn't still work in Ghana, try it somewhere else first. Try it somewhere else first, and I'm going to sell a little cheap, get some American to front it, and then bring it back to Guyana. I'm quite sure it will. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Jeremy. I think um, yeah, those, that, that's, that's excellent advice. Timing and persistence. Um, I think those are, are, are very solid points with respect to pushing culture. So it's, and, and then, of course, being aware of, of, of markets and environments as well, so, you, so you can sense the right timing. Right, good. Uh, we just have uh, some time for one other question before we proceed into our next talk. Have, uh, I saw the dude in the laptop there. I saw the dude in the laptop there smiling. He must have a question. I don't even know if they call it a flat top anymore. Let's call it a shit afro. <laughs> They're right here in the black shirt. Right here. That's what Look at the young Wesley Slice. <laughs> okay, I have a question. I do um, can you hear right? me? Can you hear me? Um, Maybe I can hear a lot of reverb. You should come forward. Sorry to stop. Up. Right. Um, all right. Thanks very much um, for the discussion. I, I just heard it because I'm preoccupied with some other things. But I heard you make a passing reference to open data, and I wonder how much you you think open data is critical because we have begun that this year again, and I can't we can't seem to open the conversation about open data here. Uh, and I wonder, um, how has it been your experience in Barbados with open data? And um, how critical do you think that would be for the success of some of those things that you're talking about? Well, your, your question ties in very closely. Thank you for the question. But it, it ties in very closely to what Elton is talking about. That is how you change cultures. We um, just here to share data. If it, if it were that we'd like to share data as much as we think we do, then the Ministry of Finance wouldn't have the tax problem that it's having right now. So, and, and I'm not saying that we're just tax sheets, but it could be the case that the Ministry of Finance doesn't even keep proper data itself. And if it were open, then maybe others could validate it. But also on the other end, maybe there are tax sheets, I can't tell you. So in the Caribbean, generally, we have a common experience of not trusting each other enough. But I think if you want open data to succeed, the conversation has to change from trusting each other to not to openly not trusting each other. In other words, the United States of America has so much open data simply because everything is scrutinized, because nobody trusts anybody in the States. So already, we have the grounds for which we can actually cause an open data revolution. It, it, the problem is, I, I don't know if you have to do it through the law, I don't know if the American legal system, uh, because they don't trust each other in their own legal systems, they don't trust each other within their own legislation, right? They don't trust each other. So therefore, that's why they always come with these strange bills and executive orders that seemingly are racist and whatnot. Well, not all of this, but I'm talking to Trump. So the, the, the thing about encapsulating or creating a culture of open data comes through, at least for our existence, at least for how mature we are as a democracy. Meaning, most of you would not go in front of the president's house right now and say, we want access to how many deaths you have at Georgetown um, Public Hospital. Or, we want access to how much money, and this might sound very, very interesting, but I'll say, we want to know how much money was spent on the Marriott, or 
as opposed to speculation. We want to see, we want a contractor's general's office, which is something that happens in Jamaica, but doesn't happen in Barbados. If you had citizens that voted based on those issues, not totally, but primarily, then because of that lack of trust, you would find that laws we push to present data. Politicians present, I'll give you a simple example. Politicians present data in Guyana because I've watched Parliament a good few times, as they have in Barbados and as I have watched in St. Lucia before. They present data only if it serves to, to, to um, it serves to make them look innocent. If you see where I'm coming from, it serves to make them look innocent. So open data from a structural perspective is something that won't happen unless the people argue for it. Another way you can go about it is volunteering your services to create open data. So case in point, Eldon right now, as a leader in this community, the fact that he managed to pull so many young Guyanese developers, I want to assume that it's only Guyanese in here. So, and probably people from Suriname, if I was lucky, I would have been in there as well. Too. But um, he's a community leader. He should, if he wants to lead this open data revolution, provide open statistics on each one of you in there. I'm not talking about bank records. I'm talking about how long you spent in there. You could have some sensors in there, how long you spent in there. What topics interest you? And then, look at anything that might be of interest, and upload that to the DevX website for uh, for people after the conference, and maybe use that as marketing material for next year. And the fact that he did it, but even he, he, if he really wants to, wants to encourage you, put out how much money he made from you, how much was spent, where it was spent, because this is a community event as far as I'm concerned. Right? He's giving back. So if you put that up, that's more than enough inspiration for those following him to say, well, look, anything we have that is of the community interest, we will volunteer that data. You could even decide to start doing the APIs to your own app. You're not charged for it. Or you can create free tiers for your services and part of those free tiers, if you want to be part of the free tier service, then of course, I'm going to aggregate your data and provide it publicly. So you have to make a decision as developers to contribute to this culture of open data. And once you do it, my hope that is within a generation or less that people will follow and governments will follow. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> so you just heard from Jeremy Stephen, our first speaker for the DevX Tech Talk series. Jeremy, again, thanks so much for, for lending up your time to share your insights with us. Uh, it was time well spent. Thank you so much. If you'd like to follow Jeremy's talks, he's on Facebook. Can we, can we publicize you a bit? Can you hear me? Yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead. So, so if you'd like to follow Jeremy's talks, yeah, he's on Facebook. Go ahead, go ahead. And he frequently uh, blogs um, about this, blogs really about, about various topics of this nature, um, uh, economics and so forth. So, you can find him on Facebook. Thanks so much, Jeremy. All right. Cheers, man. All right. Thank you.